Today, I'm back at John Kufleitner's to take a look at this bulletproof 1954 Chevy Bel Air. But before we take the tour, if you've just stumbled upon this channel for the very first time, you've hit the gold mine. This channel, we do mostly classic cars, some exotics, lots of orphan cars. If that is something that you enjoy watching, I invite you to hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon to never miss a video. Also, if you dig the content, like this video so more people can see it. Okay, let's talk 54 Bel Air. The 54 Bel Air was the second year, more or less a carryover year from the 1953 model. Chevy offered three trim levels in 54. The base model was the 150 series, the middle of the road 210 series, and the top of the heap was the Chevy Bel Air. This is the lineup. It started in 1953, 150, 210, Bel Air. Bel Air will stay at the top until the introduction of the Impala in 1958. Check out this beautiful advertising that Chevy did to feature the 13 beautiful models they created in 1954 with three great series. Convertible is only in the Bel Air series. You can't get the convertible in the 210 or the 150. Also note, there is a wagon for each series. So you got a wagon in the 150, the 210, and the Bel Air. And the Bel Air one is sort of like a tin woody, what they would call a tin woody. It only has wood around the, it's wooden veneer around the windows. If I read that correctly, I could be wrong. Okay, let's get back to the Bel Air. We're going to go back to this slide for a second because under the contents, it shows you the series of car. And then it also shows you what other cars they made for that. So like a two-door, four-door, you know, body designs. So under the Bel Air, they made a four-door, a two-door sedan, a sports coupe, convertible, and the Townsman wagon. Chevy offered an array of features in 1954. So many things to make your driving experience easier. According to Chevy, they offered easy eye safety plate glass, which had a light green tint, and it was supposedly supposed to help reduce heat and glare from the sun. Chevy also claimed that it would protect your eyes from the high beams. There wouldn't be as much glare. In the comment section below if this was an improvement or not so much. They also offered extra large brakes. Uh, Chevy went to 11 inches in diameter drum brakes. They have a water resistant ignition system, convenient luggage compartment. Man, Chevy's pulling out all the stops in 1954. At an all new low price, Chevy now offered power steering as well as power seats and power windows. It's funny that they call it automatic seats and automatic windows, but you still have to push the button for it to work. So it's not really automatic. Okay, let's talk specs. Our Bel Air, they made two Bel Air two door cars, the sports coupe and the sedan. I'm pretty sure we have the sports coupe because if you had the sedan, it would be a post car and ours does not have a post. Sports coupes, they made 66,378 in 1954, weighs 3,298 pounds, 197 and a half inches long, 73 inches wide, 59 inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 115 inches. It cost $2,050 back in 1954, and that would be equivalent to you going down and spending $22,032.47. Let's talk engines. Chevy only had one engine on offer for 1954 for the Bel Air series, and that was the 235 inline six with overhead valves, four main bearings. It was made out of cast iron. There was two different configurations. It depended on the transmission you selected. If one got the three-speed column shift manual unit, it made 115 horsepower at 3,700 RPMs, had a compression ratio of 7.5 to 1, and it was either fed through a single barrel Rochester carburetor or a single barrel Carter carburetor. If one selected the two-speed power glide unit, the engine made 125 horsepower. A couple features of the 235 that I wanna point out real quick. It was nicknamed the Blue Flame 6. It's the same engine that's in the Corvette. It has a full pressurized oil system. It's not like the Babbitt Busters from years previous. It also features aluminum pistons. Look at this design. This feels like plastic at the top there. It doesn't feel like steel, maybe it's Bakelite. 
I'm not entirely sure if it's Bakelite, what kind of plastic material it is, but it feels like plastic. This looks like vinyl. Armrest there. Door handle to get out there. Window crank for the big window. And notice it's all trimmed out at the top and the sides. This is for the vent window. I'm not sure why this is on here like that. If that's some sort of rain deflector. I don't know. In the comments section, what is this? Why is it on there? The mirrors are totally manual. You have to move them yourself. Now onto the button switches and knobs. Is it me or does it look like this dashboard almost looks like a 1949 Ford truck to you. I am definitely getting those vibes and I haven't been in that era of truck for a while. It's not identical, but it's similar. Okay, speedometer with odometer inside and we're going to back the camera angle up just a wee bit so we can see the drive. Different drive modes, park, neutral, drive, low, reverse. Moving to the center gauges, starting at the top, temperature, to the right, fuel, in the center, turn signal indicators, left and right, at the bottom, aperture gauge, to the right of that, oil pressure. Off to the very right, almost off screen, is a clock. This is the location of the cigarette lighter. Right next to it is the ignition switch. Right next to it is all the climate controls. Moving right, radio and radio controls. This is the handbrake. Pull this out as the emergency brake. Gas pedal, brake pedal. That's the high beam switch. That's where it should be. I don't know why they stopped doing that. In the comment section below, if you know the last year that they put those on and why they stopped doing it that way. I had an 88, well, I didn't have it, but my parents had an 88 Econline van that still had it. But I had an 89 Mercury Grand Marquis and I also owned two town cars that didn't have it. This is the heating unit this is where it goes right there blows down at your feet or defrost it doesn't blow straight out of the dash okay it's time for the glove box test let's uh let's test and see how big this glove box is so cinematic camera canon r6 it's a mirrorless camera all right getting into the glove box owner's manual is inside the glove box so that's a really nice touch. This is a 1954. So the camera could go in here. So it fits in there just like that. It looks like over the hood. Notice the uh, mirror is mounted on the dashboard, not mounted at the top here. Sunshades. Pretty, pretty standard. They don't have any mirrors, just sunshades. That's how much space I have. There's lots of hand room. The steering wheel moves freely. It's not in your lap. This is what I look like. Lots of headroom, lots and lots of headroom. Could wear a hat driving this car if I wanted to. I like to show the windows going up and down in these cars because they don't go straight up or straight down. Both windows are down and there's no pillar in the center. It gives it a totally different look. Also notice the back, this windshield's one piece. In previous years, it was three pieces. The lines came down around here. Gas goes here. Two things I totally forgot to mention during the actual episode that I want to mention now before we go on to the pros and cons. 1953 was the first year Chevy offered a one-piece windshield. Also, the fleet side fastback model was gone. This body design is essentially a facelifted style line. On to the pros and cons. Pros. All the pros and cons I'm getting out of the complete collectible cars blue chip auto investment 70 years 1930 to 2000 by richard 
Langworth. Pros, easy on the wallet, fairly easy to come by as a good number have survived. More colorful paint and interiors than ever before. Cons, little collector interest, less integrated styling. I don't agree 100% with the cons because these cars are really hot right now. And to prove that, Kufleitner, John Kufleitner had five of these cars and they are all gone. As soon as they put them up on the market, they are gone. They are like the hottest thing right now. Maybe not quite the hottest thing, but they're really, really popular. Also, 1954 was the last year Chevy had the six-cylinder without a V8 option in their cars and sedans. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate all the support. And until next time, toodaloo!